Uh, we don't have any sort of set order, but I'll just ask any board members who have questions or comments to, to please go ahead and obviously don't be shy. I, I can start if in. you like. Oh, no, oh, go ahead. You go ahead, Jess. All right. Um, I'm just I'm trying to understand um, the commercial rate, uh, the commercial price increase. And I know that, you know, from the narrative, it says 3.6 percent increase. But I also realize there's uh, additional rate growth expected because of unrealized prior rate increase allowances that didn't occur. Um, and so I'm just looking at, you know, the tables here and I see if you can just turn to the. Let me just see. think of which which. Are, yeah, so there's two places where I see commercial price. One is in the 10.2 percent here. And then on the other page, I see the 3.6 percent, which is presumably the uh, charge master increase just for this year. And then the 8.6, which is just for this year. And I just wanted to understand Sal and then maybe Jen, if you want to add on to this i'm trying to make sure that i understand what is the actual uh in the pocket cost of commercial you know rate payers in your community what are they going to feel this year in terms of the commercial rate increase is it the 8.6 is it the yeah just maybe if everybody could answer that somebody could answer that <laughs> I'll just start by saying, so yeah, this is designed to just catch the annual from 23 to 24, and this would factor in that 1.5 million that, again, I think is an area of risk uh, in terms of uh, Gifford's uh, ability to um, realize uh, the full amount. So that would be the highest amount if they were to get that all in their negotiation, which... Um, uh, in other words, if the carriers were going to, willing to retroactively apply previously approved rate increases, it would be the in increases that. this year would reflect those that have been approved in previous years, but not implemented due to the um, work on the charge master as well as the um, EMR upgrade that they're rolling out. Is that fair, Jen? I don't want to. It is, but I think if I could, Sarah, the the total. Um, Board member homes for the one and a half million is from the 22s, 3.5%, and as well as the FY23s, a 3.65% request that we had. Those are the dollars of combined of those two years. This year is 3.6%, as you see on the chart here. That is $853,000. So in total, it would be $2.3 million in net. Um, that we are requesting of the commercial payers. Hopefully that helps with the tie it out. Oh, it does. And in terms of the charge master increase from 2022 or the last time that it was actually updated to now, what is that going to look like? That would be the total of 10.2 that you saw in the other chart. Okay. Between 20, this one's 23 to 24. The other percentage is 22 to 24. Okay, that's what I thought. I just wanted to make sure it was is all everybody's on the same page about where all these moving parts are with price. <laughs> okay, um, and then I, the other area that was a bit unclear for me was in the labor expenses, um, and I recognize that some of that is driven by provider transfers that are you know distorting that. I also in the narrative it was a little bit unclear. Um, in the section under labor expenses, there's a discussion about having, you know, um, a wage analysis done, and it said that uh, the wage analysis suggested that, you know, the wages were significantly below market. Considering affordability, GMC implemented only half of the increases in fiscal year 22, deferred the remaining half to fiscal year 23, and then it said that the, the next paragraph talks about um, the expertise of the compensation consultant suggesting that there's going to be proposed increases in again to catch up in the fiscal year 2024 budget. So I'm trying to understand exactly uh, what the wage increases were exclusive of provider transfers. I don't want that muddied in here, but just what were the wage increases for existing employees between 21, 22, 22, 23, and now 23, 24, just so that I can understand where some of this is coming from and when they were implemented. Is that a possible? I, if you have to follow up with that, Jen, that is totally fine. I'm just trying to understand what, what's in the narrative. 
where this 22% growth rate in labor expenses is coming from apart from provider transfers. And so tracking that over time. Sure. And I apologize. I really should have been a bit more clear in, in that statement. So what I really should have said was we incorporated the consultant's proposed 2024 cost of living adjustment of 4% into our budget. And if it helps, um, I can share the org wide uh, board member homes, if that helps. So in uh, FY 2022, between market increases and a cost of living adjustment of 3%, that expense was $1.7 million in total. In uh, FY 23, between the market increases, the remaining market increases that we mentioned in the narrative, as well as a 3% or excuse me, 4% aggregate cost of living adjustment that we just did here in, in uh, at the beginning of May, that was a $2.3 million expense. And then for the 4% increase in FY 2024, and, and this is for a cost of living adjustment. So unless the market moves again, we're hoping that we're remaining a bit static there. Um, that expense is 835,000 in total. Okay. Hopefully that helps clarify. It does, but even better, I apologize for that. Terms. So what was the market adjustment plus the cost of living in each year? So you've given me dollars and and the cost of living for each year. So it'd be just helpful to understand what was the market adjustment plus the cost of living for each of those um, years. Just so we can get a sense of how much catch up had to happen because of the, the market. Oh, I can isolate the market, but I could definitely get that back to you. Um, That's great. Those, yeah, that was aggregate for both both items. So I can certainly isolate uh, the market adjustments and um, send that Thank to you. you. Certainly. That's great. And then my my final question is, in in I think most experiences, um, EMRs implementation always come with some productivity reductions. Um, it's, you know, just, it's sort of par for the course, it seems, when hospitals implement these big EMR shifts. And I'm just wondering how you factored in, if you factored in reduction in utilization simply because of the EMR implementation. Um, great question. That does normally happen with an implementation. However, we feel that the operational efficiencies, because we're going from a lot of manual processes in the current EMR um, to more automated processes in the new EMR, we feel that's going to counteract any productivity decline that we would see um, in the FY 2024 budget. We feel pretty confident about that with the way we've uh, built the new EMR. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much. Back to you, Chair Foster. All right. Thank you. Um, I heard Member Lunch. Uh, go ahead if you have some questions. Thanks. Um, hi, Jen. Thanks. And Dan, thanks for joining us. Um, I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit to your ACO participation in 2024, what you're expecting for programs. We will be participating in the Medicaid and MVP programs uh, that are offered through One Care for FY24. Thank you. Um, and then also, I'm wondering how you are thinking about uh, the Medicaid redeterminations and if you've included any budgetary impacts related to uh, changes in coverage. We've not included any assumptions regarding the redeterminations in this budget. One could um, estimate that we would possibly return to our 2019 percentages uh, for bad debt and free care, but I hes hesitate to do that for two reasons. Honestly, board member lunch. Uh, one is the changes that we've been implementing with our pre-registration process that we mentioned in the narrative. That would certainly have a more positive impact um, for those particular patients. And the other way, uh, other item that we have was the way we were classifying our um, average generally billed discount prior. Uh, that was in bad debt instead of in the contractual line. So it was an accounting change that we did. And that would certainly have an impact. You know, and the other thing, obviously, is I, I really don't want to run the risk of understating my net revenue and overstating my bad debt assumptions for something that's a bit unpredictable for us at the moment. That makes sense. I, 
One thing I'm a little curious about um, in terms of the approach that we've seen in this area is there doesn't seem to be a lot of assumptions related to people moving from Medicaid reimbursements to commercial reimbursements, which certainly I think you wouldn't expect the entire population, but you would expect a little bit of that to some degree. So I, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, Jen, but I welcome them if you do. Yeah, no. Too much. Um, just in our experience thus far, it's been a couple of months here. When I have conversations with our financial advocate, it unfortunately has been in the other direction. It's going to self-pay. I think she maybe had one individual that she was able to um, see, recognize going to commercial. It's a little early in that, I think, at the moment. But, you know, obviously we would like to see it going into the commercial bucket as well. Um, but from current experience, just in the last couple of months in my conversations with her, it's really been a um, going from Medicaid to self-pay currently. Thanks. Um, I think that's, I think my other questions have already been answered. Thank you. Good morning, Jen and, and team. This is Tom Walsh. I, I just have a question about the cost report. If we could go back to that um, tab, please, Sarah. Um, Jen, it was um, very helpful. I think as you explained, things like um, nursing education can be categorized uh, in one bucket, allocated to one bucket for a cost report and allocated to another bucket for um, a finance report. And I'm, I'm wondering if you could just help us understand, you don't have to go into any great detail about your particular organization, but help us understand how uh, a finance team decides which bucket to place those um, kind of shared services that are not either directly administration or direct patient care. How do people decide to, where to allocate those? Sure. There are some rules that we do follow from a cost reporting standpoint um, that we do adopt when we're classifying those as well in our financial statements. There's some variation, though, that that is that happens among the hospitals, the one that I pointed out, obviously. Um, and so you try to look at those of what is really directly uh, associated on the clinical side and try to parse those out as best as possible versus those that might have a uh, dual purpose. So for example, they have administrative duties, but also may have clinical duties and try to isolate those two components of an FTE, so to speak, or salary. And that's how we do it here. Um, we really scrutinize the difference between the two so that we can make sure we're putting it in the right place. And as you heard me mention, we continue. It takes some time when you're evaluating cost reports over the years to start just refine that and where those um, departments should actually be, and we've been making those necessary changes. But I think that really kind of sums up how we look at it and how we would want to classify those on both the income statement and, and the cost report. Mm -hmm. So it, it seems that's excellent. Thanks. It helps me a lot. And it seems like each of the uh, reporting requirements has its own set of rules that every organization would have to follow but there are also areas where discretion is needed. And when say a regulator starts looking at one, um, it's only then that there would start to be a um, standardization among the facilities the regulator's looking at, because there's quite a bit of discretion allowed, if I'm hearing you correctly. There is, I think, you know, Sarah and I had sidebarred on coming up with maybe a more standardized approach for all of us to report um, so that you're evaluating an apples to apples versus an apples to oranges, um, because that particular line on the cost report can also, I don't want to get too weedy, but there's something called a home office cost report. Um, mm -hmm. In my past, we have filed one of those and it takes all of the overhead expenses from, let's say, um, a network structure and puts them all in that line where there could be some clinical functions in that that you would want to parse out. And I think you know, I'm happy to work with the staff as well in creating maybe more apples to apples standard approach to um, 
you know, yeah. this. And I think there's definitely some variability when you're in a small hospital because you wear many hats. Um, so, you know, we do time studies so we can isolate some of that as well. But I think um, to try to mitigate that variability, we can maybe come up with a standardized approach for the hospitals to report. Great. I hope we're able to take you up on that offer of, of helping create a standardized way that we could use across the state uh, because the dis the discre the different forms having different rules and still allowing for discretion um, is true across the country and is true with all the hospitals that uh, make up the peer groups. Um, so helping us create a standardized way within our state would be, uh, I think, really helpful long term. So thank you very much. Dr. Merman, do you have any questions or comments? Yeah, I just have one quick question. Thank you uh, both for the, um, well, there's more than two of you. All three of you so far have spoke for the presentation and and submission. Um, uh, Mr. Bennett, I just had a quick question for you. It could go to either, I guess. With regards to the New England Alliance for Health uh, group purchasing, does that also uh, help you with um, insurance contracts and negotiations? So we uh, we participate in NIA both in terms of our uh, employee benefit insurances uh, and also with our normal group purchasing supplies, that sort of uh, equipment, that sort of thing. Uh, so we do get, um, you know, we do have advantage of that purchasing power on the employee benefit um, side of things. Um, and uh, some of the business insurances, but not all of them. We don't we don't go through uh, them for all of our um, uh, uh, for all of our business type insurances. But but when you but negotiate not, yeah. with insurance carriers, th th they're not involved in that process. Oh no. no no I'm sorry for for our reimbursement you mean? Yes. Oh I'm sorry no they are not in uh, for that. I'm sorry I do you, misunderstood. That's what you're okay. I, no I, I apologize for the lack of clarity. Um, do you do that directly from Gifford with the, the carriers for reimbursement? Or do you have a, a, a in-between company that helps you with that? Go ahead, Jen. Yeah, I, <laughs> I knew he was going to point to me. Um, yes, we do use a third-party uh, firm in that negotiation process. Um, that doesn't mean that we don't have a direct line of communication with the payers either, um, but we do use utilize a third party. Okay. Thank you. Um, I had just a couple on the this is the labor. Uh, the number of FTEs went down pretty significantly, 287 down to 191. I assume that's mostly due to the provider transfers. And then the uh, the compensation per FTE jumped up um, fairly significantly around the same time. And I was wondering if you could speak to that. Was that because of the types of providers that were transferring out or what else could you attribute that to? Sure, I think there are two issues <clears throat> that are contributing to the opposing relationship that we're seeing here. One is that um, we moved uh, a considerable amount of FTEs into our Gifford Shared Services Division. Those were originally reported in GMC as well as our daycare. And so we did move those FTEs out of what we report for just the hospital. And I think that's a little bit of the distortion there and why you're seeing such a deep dive in that particular line. And then also, you know, I think it's important to, from the um, salary line um, that, you know, staff vacancies would have an impact on this calculation. Also, we report actual FTEs in the calculation that we provide versus total position FTE calculations. So if we do have a higher turnover, which we do here at Gifford in any of those mid to lower salary ranges, then that calculation of dollars on that upper line is actually going to look higher. Um, so I think that's the the reason we're seeing those that opposing relationship there. Okay. Um, and then 
in terms of the anesthesiologists that you use, do you currently employ directly any anesthesiologists? And how has that number changed over the last few years? Or we, Dan, you'll have to correct me if I'm wrong. I want to say it was last year or the year before. We are using a contracted service um, similar to, as I mentioned, that OB hospitalist service that we're using now. So we do not have any employed anesthesiologists any longer, although um, the anesthesiologists that we that were employed with give her did transition to that organization. Um, we've had some turnover with them over the last year or two, um, but in terms of us actually uh, having that as a, an expense, it's in a purchase service line versus a salary line for the anesthesia service. And Dan, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. No, I think that answered it. Uh, I, think, I think it's been two years. Is that correct, Rebecca? Yes, yes, so it's been two years and we've had that service. And I was curious how that has worked out from both, uh, you know, availability of anesthesiologists when you need them, and then in terms of the uh, cost. Rebecca, do you want to jump in on the, uh, so uh, Rebecca oversees the contract and the staffing of that uh, service. Yes. Thank you. So um, one of the big changes that was made over the course of time was um, we moved from an all MD service to a mixture of MD and CRNA, which has actually gone really well. Um, as uh, Jen said, we did transition all of the clinicians at the time over to the contracted service. And over time, we have, you know, replaced them with different folks as they've, you know, moved on to different places. Um, most of our anesthesia, anesthesia providers live right here in our community. Um, even though they're contracted providers, they live close by. Um, or they stay in housing that we have here. And so they are still available immediately. Um, you know, we have a 20 minute time for them to come in, but most of them are here within just a couple of minutes. So they're still 24 seven um, and they're still available with us. We've had a really great working relationship with the organization um, and we have a really nice open line of communication back and forth between them. And have you found this to be a cost savings? With the complement of providers that Rebecca mentioned, <clears throat> going from an all MD model to a combination of MD and CRNA, we did have a cost savings there. It was, don't hold me to this, but it was in the ballpark of about a half a million dollars. And this third party, um, is it just made up of anesthesiologists that used to work at Gifford or are there others? And then it's a compound question, I apologize. But then the second part of it is, are they working with other hospitals or just Gifford? Um, we have a, the group that's here with us now are not necessarily, they're, they're not all the folks who were here when we made the transition. Um, and for the most part, the group that's here consistently only work here. Um, we do have folks, which is the benefit of going with this organization, who float from other uh, other local hospitals um, when we have someone out on vacation or, you know, some other type of leave. Okay. And do you can you speak at all to how many other hospitals they may be working with? Um, I wouldn't have intimate knowledge of that for each one of them, but generally speaking, it's it's one or two. So they're here and they're in there somewhere else. Um, but not they're they're not coming from all over the place. And but this particular group that we're contracted with works with a handful of other hospitals uh, in Vermont and New Hampshire. Yep. Can I just ask a follow up question because I think I'm a little confused by the word group, whether that means it sounded like, Jill, you were speaking about the people who come work at Gifford as opposed to the organization they work for. And then I think Dan was talking about, and maybe Owen was asking about the group that the individuals work for. So yeah. can I just get a little clarification there? So we, we contract with a third party anesthesiology group. Um, so it's a, it's a private company that employs uh, anesthesiologists and CRNAs 
Uh, that group then contracts with uh, hospitals to provide that service at their hospitals. Um, and that, um, that company, that anesthesiology group, works with a handful of uh, hospitals within the, you know, within the, the region um, close to us in Vermont and New Hampshire. Rebecca was noting that the individual um, uh, doctor, anesthesiologists and CRNAs that work at Gifford may also work at one or two of those other hospitals that their company uh, contracts with. Um, and it just varies by their personal preference. Did that, did I, did I get it? Yes, thank you. Okay. That's okay, what thanks. I, that's what I thought I heard, but I just wanted to clarify okay. so that it was yeah. a little clearer. Business is uh, confusing. Um, I want to follow up on some of what others had asked about this um, retroactive adjustment to the uh, charge master. Um, is it accurate that Gifford has not increased uh, the gross charge on any of the services in three years? Is it three years? Two. Two. Uh, twenty is starting in FY 2022. We were not able to implement that increase. We were hoping that we could implement that increase. We were originally supposed to go live with our EMR in July of this fiscal year in 2023. So we were hoping that we may, and we mentioned this in our hearing last year, that that was our hope. Unfortunately, we did have to postpone our go live to October. So now we're two years of those increases we've not been able to implement. Any of them? Any of them. On any service any, line. Right, right, right. And just so I'm clear, the, the issue exactly was, why couldn't you? So there were two things that were creating this particular issue. One was we needed to completely rebuild our charge master. Um, there was a lot of revenue code changes that needed to be implemented, location of service lines um, and things of that nature. So we've completely rebuilt that and we're prepared to go live with that, obviously, with the new EMR. Um, and also we needed to implement or not even implement but undergo a price analysis and a price study of our current pricing structure and we've also done that in tandem as we've been gearing up for our go live and so those two things really have prevented us from implementing those price increases we certainly don't want to you know some prices go up some prices go down when you do a price analysis and i certainly wouldn't want to um put that additional percentage on prices that we needed to reduce. So those two things were really why we were not able to do that. Okay. And yeah, you know, maybe somebody asked this, but what happens if the insurance companies don't agree to these increases? Well, there's always a, a negotiation, obviously, between uh, us and the payers. Um, you know, we do, without getting um, too much in the weeds of our contracts, there is language in our contracts that point to the uh, approvals by Green Mountain Care Board. Um, we have, in the last two years, as well as this year, have sought um, quite low uh, price increase requests. So we are hoping that our uh, negotiation with them will take that into account. Um, I don't know if you saw it, but I'd just point out for your awareness that the care board issued rate review decisions this year that said that um, the rate increases we allow in our hospital budget decisions are not an entitlement and that insurers are required to negotiate based on affordability, access, and quality. Um, anyway, um, I think if question. I, oh, uh, sorry, if I, I think if, if I could, 
um, Chair Foster, I, I do, you know, those two years, they they were approved, obviously, by the board. Um, and we wanted to be transparent in our budget and, and share with you that that's what we were doing. And, you know, it is a negotiation between the commercial payers and us. And, and so, you know, that is what we are seeking from them. Um, but I, I understand what you're saying. I appreciate that. Um, and thank you for the transparency. I think it's really, <laughs> it's really critical. And I want to point out that I really do appreciate the fact that you guys hit guidance three years in a row, which I don't know how many hospitals have done that, but that makes this job a little bit easier for us. Um, the last question I had was um, about how uh, physicians are generally compensated. And if you could speak to just the general um, methodology for uh, compensating physicians. And one of the things I'm trying to understand is whether or not physicians are rewarded or incentivized for um, increasing revenue, either through increased volumes or uh, increased procedures or which types of procedures. So um, we compensate, again, we're speaking about the, um, specifically about the hospital. We compensate our physicians uh, based on salary. So we derive a salary uh, utilizing uh, national surveys um, and then we evaluate them. Um, we evaluate our compensation uh, salary portion, uh, portion of the compensation based on the national surveys. Uh, in addition to that, we do have incentive programs, uh, and there's two components to that. The first one is uh, based on a, um, uh, again, um, looking at national surveys, looking at work RVU. Um, so that is a productivity uh, standard. Um, and um, uh, so that's a component of the incentive. The second component of the set of the incentive is uh, what we call citizenship. And that um, incentivizes activities that um, uh, where uh, our providers are uh, doing community outreach activities, uh, where they are participating in um, uh, medical staff quality uh, type activities, things that promote uh, the practices, things that promote a um, uh, things that. Um, promote community health, those sort of things. Um, and uh, for both the salary component and the work RBU component, we target the uh, the median on the surveys. Um, and Mr. Bennett, is there a, a set split between the work RVU and the citizenship component of the incentive comp, or can that vary? Um, for the most part, there is a dollar. There is a dollar limit on how much we pay out on that. Uh, what I'm trying to understand is so how... it's about so it's about half yeah. and half. Okay. In terms of there, those incentives would typically be about equal, the amount that they were able to um, earn through that. Right. Okay. So if the incentive comp. The median of the surveys you look at is a hundred dollars, and a position hits it a hundred percent. Fifty percent would be uh, due to their RVU performance, and fifty percent would be due to the assessment of their citizenship. So let me let me just let me let me take that example and come back and and try to explain it. So if the median is a hundred dollars, um, you know we would pay them somewhere in the range of eighty dollars on the salary. And then they would have the opportunity to earn ten dollars for citizenship and ten dollars for work RVU. I get it. To get to okay. that median, if if a hundred is the median. Understood. That helps. Thank you. Um, okay. I should have started with that. Sorry, that would have been easy. no, no. It's, I, <laughs> I misunderstood. That was great. Um, I don't have any other questions, um, Mr. Sutter or Director Lindbergh. Do you guys have any follow up? Or are you guys all set? Uh, we're set just again, testament to uh, this being the second of two hospitals under benchmark and uh, just shouts outs. Um, but the advocate may have some questions as I see Eric has arrived. Great. All right. Um, I will turn to the healthcare advocate. Uh, thank you so much and uh, apologies um, 
for the sound. If you can hear heavy machinery in the background, my neighbor has decided to restart construction. And in an odd coincidence, they work at Gifford, <laughs> which, which made me laugh uh, very hard this morning. Um, and they're wonderful. Uh, just in case. Um, so I just want to up. point out that, uh, that, that we had nothing to do with that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I didn't think you did. Uh, it's supply chain's fault and the fact that they didn't have windows. Um, so again, I want to echo um, Sarah's comment that you deserve to be applauded for coming at or under guidance for now years. Um, and that is a, a level, I think, the level of commitment to your patients and their pocketbooks that um, honestly is. Um, Good to see, and perhaps should be heard across more of the system. Um, so my questions are going to be for Jen, and it's really I'm I'm trying to understand. Um, and and member Lunge asked about this a bit, but I'm trying to understand um, the change in booking of AGB discounts to bad debt, and I think what's so correct me, Jen, or chime in, I think what that, so I think you're saying that if you had a self-pay person who was going to be charged AGB for a service, so say that service is, a, is 200 on the charge master and AGB is 100, that then they come in and regardless, and they owe 100, regardless if they pay that amount or not, that the difference between the charge master and AGB, so that added hundred gets booked as bad debt. And I know like this doesn't actually have an impact on the bottom line. I'm just trying, to, it's important to me just because I'm trying to understand how to use free care and bad debt, right? So like, I'm not working at the bottom line level. I'm kind of in the middle of it, but I don't want to make false conclusions. Uh, let me see if I can kind of use your example, Eric, kind of adjudicate this the way we normally yep. would in our organization. So taking that $200, uh, let me back up to the, the bad debt versus contractual that I mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. So we do automatically out of the gate give a 50% discount for self-pay patients on that $200 charge. So okay. that 100 initial dollars used to go to the bad debt line, we now change that and that we consider as a contractual adjustment right off okay. of the, the, the charge. So that remaining $100, if the patient, for example, qualified for some free care, let's say they qualified for 50% of that $100, so then we reduce their portion, their obligation to $50. If they were not able to pay that $50 of their obligation after 120 days in conversations trying to get them on payment plans, then that $50 we would transfer to bad debt. Oh, uh, okay. Does that help so clarify that, it? That, it that, it's more, no, that, there's, there's reserves and things that we do from an accounting standpoint, but that's really the gist of how you're to kind of adjudicate that example you gave me. And, and with that switch due to the change in, in gap accounting standards so that, you know, uh, you know, where they were trying not to have so many ways of booking things by industry type, or was that something you guys took on or a mix of the two? It's a mix of the two from the revenue the recognition and versus how we should be classifying that initial discount. Okay. And and so I understood, Jen, like this idea of the problems of looking at longi like looking longitudinally at bad debt because of this change. Now but I'm wondering like if we if we look out if we look at the system as a whole, so not just, you know, um Gifford, right? Like, could we, ex is it reasonable to expect that we're seeing similar, pro like similar changes in accounting across time amongst internal to each of the individual hospitals? Like that it's kind of difficult to compare across hospitals to likely? Um, I don't want to speak for others, but I think yeah. it's fine that perhaps the majority of the hospitals probably classify it the way I was describing, but I don't want to speak for them, obviously. 
Um, you know, there might be a couple that here and there that are are putting that to the the bad debt um, portion versus the contractual line. But so, so yeah, we, I can so only see we would my, this, yeah. my experience. Um, but obviously, you know, I I just don't want to speak for them. But I would I would presume that that's the same structure that they adopted. Okay. Okay, that makes sense and it's helpful. And then just one last thing for me, when you're talking about the 2024 budget and you're looking at free care and you're saying you're aligning that with um, historical trends from before and after or during continuous coverage, not after, because that's right now. Um, but um, I'm wondering, had, had you thought about or had you included in that like what the effect of the implementation of Act 119 will be and if your free care policies become more generous due to that because that's like a quarter worth of impact right July 1 July August September. yeah Correct. Um, we're moving in that direction now, Eric, to adopt what is stipulated in the Act 119. Um, it will have an impact because it does change that threshold because currently we're at 300% uh, of poverty care. So that is going to change that. But obviously, we're we're going to adopt that. Um, we're going to be looking at that because we've been waiting for our go live um, and then really start to adopt that. Obviously, we'll meet the deadline. Um, but it, to answer your question, it, it certainly will have an impact um, on the amount that you see in those two two lines, just because currently it's yeah. under that threshold is stipulated. Okay. Yeah, I think you know what's what's interesting, and I I don't I haven't looked at uh, Gifford's FAP in a while, um, but it seems like you, you probably also, in addition to the FPL changes, the limits, the actually i mean it may not affect gifford as much but for some hospitals the statewide um criteria instead of being put at the limited to the service area is a is going to be a really big impact for some hospitals mm -hmm. i don't know if that works out for gifford but that's kind of there's some things that are kind of way deep inside of act 119 um that may have a bigger impact and i think you know we should talk or i think mike probably send you a letter, Jen, and we'll be rolling out a bunch of stuff um, going forward. Um, but yeah, Act 119, it's weird how that played out. So uh, <laughs> you have to kind of look at it with a magnify glass. Right. And and believe me, I've read through it a few times too, Eric, and we're happy to work with Healthcare Advocate on, you know, the changes that we're implementing or, or some, as you mentioned, that we already have in place. Yeah, um, you know, in terms of providing free care statewide um, and not just within our health service area. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, um, Jen. And again, uh, thank you for coming in uh, in a way that conforms with the guidance. Thank you, Eric. Can, Dr. I, can I just ask a quick follow up question on on uh, Eric's question? I, I'm sorry, I missed in the initial the $200 charge that you give the 50 percent discount up front where do you where did you say you put that in accounting how does that it goes in our contractual allowance line and is that reflected in the exhibit nine in the in the budget submission yes that would Which, flow through our contractual and the two lines that we entered at the very bottom we added the bad debt and free care that would be net of that discount but the contractual line would contain that discount Um, so, so that first hundred dollar deduction would go under free care. That first hundred line would go under contractual allowances. Okay, because there's, I'm just trying to figure. There's not a contractual allowances on Exhibit Nine. I'm just trying to figure out which one. Oh, is that? I believe that might be the one that is just gross and net, Sarah. If I recall, okay. So. Yeah, that's that Delta. doesn't have our, our detail. If you look at our income statements, there's a contractual allowance line that's a negative okay. number, and okay. that will reflect where that is hitting on the okay, income cool. statement. All right, I'll read through that. Thank you. Certainly. I appreciate it. Um, I had a quick follow-up. On the third party that negotiates the uh, rates with the insurance companies, is that Helms & Co.? Yes. 
And if it's in the contract that the insurance companies have to pay the amount approved by the GMCB, why do you have to pay a third party to negotiate? Not all of the contracts have that in there, and that's not the only thing that we utilize Helms for. We um, work with them to build what we call a matrix so that we almost have a contract management type of methodology so we can look at inpatient versus outpatient versus professional how much we should be getting from each of those contracts so they don't only do the negotiation but they also assist us in creating the different amount of reimbursement by each service by each payer the other thing that homes and company also assists us with is um Anytime a payer makes uh, an, a, a change to their policies, we do ask Helms to alert us of those payer policy changes. If we also notice that um, our claims may not be adjudicating in accordance with those contracts, we work with Helms to decipher um, you know, that delta that we might be experiencing and have that conversation with the payers as well so that we can ensure we're getting reimbursed at the rate that we were contracted so there's there's other functions um that that particular third party does versus just the negotiation i hope that helps yeah, yeah. it does and chair foster i would just add to that that as a, a small organization like gifford and i assume that uh you know the majority of the the hospitals in vermont are in somewhat the same boat there's only so much bandwidth we can that that we have to do some of these more technical activities so uh, it is uh, more efficient, and in some cases, we don't have a lot of other options uh, but to work with some people who do this uh, on a on a full time basis. And if I you could, know. it's it's much more cost effective uh, than it would be hiring an FTE for that additional set of services. No, understood. Yeah, no, appreciate that very much. Um, okay, I have nothing else. Um, I will open it up to public comment. You know, and I have to say, I, I've done a fair number of hearings now at the care board, and the only hearings I've never had a public comment on are hospital budgets, which I find so surprising. Every other hearing we have, there's so many public comments. We'll probably get um, some Wednesday. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, yeah. Okay. Um, well, be that as it may, um, I will turn it back to you guys for uh, your closing statements, and thank you very much for your presentation and for observing the budget guidance. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Chair Foster. I mean, appreciate the opportunity to, to talk with you all today. And again, uh, thank uh, thank you all from your team for the work that you've put into this as well. Um, I guess I would just conclude by stating that, uh, you know, given our, my opening comments, um, we wanted to stress the um, the level to which Gifford is a, is a community focused uh, organization. We do work with uh, very closely with with our community members to uh, assess what the needs are in the community and then uh, with our leadership and our board and our medical staff and others uh, to ensure that we are uh, organizing our our services in a way that that can meet those needs and we do leverage the relationships both local and uh, from a wider um, region to meet those needs uh, as you've heard about uh, both um, in my comments earlier and then obviously with some of the other services that we that we contract and and work with so um, uh, i just want to again thank you for the opportunity today and um, as always please feel free to reach out to us uh, if you have any follow-up questions and uh, have a great weekend great thank you all very much uh, we will adjourn uh, until 10 a.m